Okay, I got cut off because uh, I got a text message. But we have different glands. The pituitary gland, which is um, responsible for uh, sleep cycle. This is the first gland in your head. It's between. It's kind of between your eyes. They call it. They call it the third eye. Um, it's actually not the pituitary. It's a pineal gland. Um, this is what this is what's called the pineal gland, and this is where I think Descartes thought that the soul was. The second gland down is the pituitary gland, which is also called the master gland. Remember, the second quadrant is always um, kind of bossy. It tells other glands what to do. It's it's order homeostasis. This is what the pituitary gland is like. Um, then you got the third gland, which is the thyroid gland and the thyroid gland I think it has stuff to do with your, your muscles so it's it's related to your actions to things that you do so this makes sense this is the third quadrant then you have the parathyroid glands which are actually four glands so you got the four glands um, and one the parathyroid glands which kind of do the same thing but kind of the opposite as the parathy as, as a thyroid gland um, and then you have, so these are all kind of in your head, then you have the separation. Now you have the thymus. You got the fifth one. So this is like Jupiter, right? You have Mercury, uh, Venus, Earth, Mars, then you get the Jupiter thymus. Remember, Jupiter was big and it protected these ones. Well, what does the thymus do? The thymus is responsible for creating antibodies and... Uh, well, basically, it's part. It's essential to your immune system. Maybe not antibodies, but T cells, B cells. Yeah, just 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 things that are that are in your immune system. Your immune system fights diseases. So we're in the second quadrant, right? The thymus. We have moved from the first quadrant. Now we're in the second quadrant. And remember, the second quadrant is always about protection. Um. This is the ISFJ, the thymus. Here's the first quadrant. Now we're at the ISFJ, the, the thymus. It's pr the protector. Um, and then you go along and you keep going down and the different glands of your body fit the same pattern. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the... Parts of your brain. Um, like the talent. Okay, so your brain, when there's, you have the neural. Uh, the neural tube. And it's separated into the telencephalon, the diencephalon, the mesencephalon. Um, the metencephalon and the myencephalon. These are these are the parts. These these become the parts of your brain, um, and then there's a the spinal cord that the brain's connected to. But the parts of your brain are the telencephalon, the diencephalon, the mesencephalon, the mesencephalon, the myencephalon. Takes the same pattern. The telencephalon is the cortex that's responsible for learning. You know, this is first quadrant oriented stuff. The diencephalon includes the um, the thalamus and things like this. The thalamus is responsible for hormones and also homeostasis in the body. This is second quadrant stuff. Then you have the mesencephalon. This is responsible for movement. Remember, the third quadrant is always responsible for doing and everything. So we have the... I'm giving really broad stuff because I don't know all the details. But we have the telencephalon, the diencephalon, the mesencephalon. This is you know responsible for doing stuff in your app for actions in your body uh, motor stuff then you have the metencephalon and this includes the pons and the cerebellum the cerebellum is called the little brain because it's kind of like a mini miniature model of your whole brain 
it looks exactly like a microcosm of your whole brain. So remember the fourth is different, but it encompasses the other ones. Um, and also it's the pawns has stuff to do with dreaming. So remember the fourth quadrant was dreaming. Um, it's kind of different than, than these ones. And then you have the myencephalon and this is really uh, primitive homeostasis type of stuff. Um, so we have the same type of pattern within the brain, the quadrant model. Um, let's see what else. So I wanted to talk a little bit about sociology stuff. Um, let's see. One thing that I wanted to talk about was... Um, Let's talk about so basically everything you go through sociology it's the same type of thing there's a ton of stuff it all fits the quadrant model but let's just talk about some some things that are interesting I think um, one thing is Karl Marx He's a sociologist. He um, thought that there would be a communist, uh, a revolution of the proletariat. The proletariat is a working class that they would take over the um, the bourgeoisie, the owning class, and they would take power. And a, a communistic society would be set up where everybody is kind of equal. Um, this never happened. People think that communism actually happened, but what Marx wanted to happen never happened because the proletariat didn't really have a revolution. What happened was <clears throat> Marxist intellectuals kind of sparked a, a revolution and they ended up taking power and it wasn't a true communist revolution like Marx envisioned. Um, so I've heard people say, oh yeah, Marx was a horrible person and communism doesn't work. Well, Marx's idea of communism never was set up. Um, it never happened. Uh, I read Marx's book and interestingly in the, you know, stuff like contemplation words that are part of the quadrant model were italicized. It's kind of interesting. Um... All right. Uh, Nietzsche thought that there couldn't be a society where all the classes are everybody's equal because he thought that there needs to be some sort of stratification in society. There's different types of people. There needs to be stratification. Nietzsche envisioned a society that would produce what he called the ubermenschen, the superhumans. Um, and he thought that this society would be different from our normal society in that it wouldn't be so obsessed with morality. Nietzsche was an INTJ. Um, so he's a, a first quadrant of the fourth quadrant. And so he was kind of against this quadrant, the morality quadrant, because there's always an antagonism um, between the fourth and the second. So he thought that morality wouldn't be such a big deal um, and that people, when, when they're free of the chains of religion and morality, kind of like what, what Marx said, um, things would be better. Marx said that religion is the opiate of the masses, that it keeps people dumb. It keeps people um, believing that there's going to be a better life after their death. And therefore, in this life, they don't have to worry so much because they're going to be rewarded in a life later. So it keeps them docile. An opiate means it's a, it's a drug that keeps you docile. Um, I've actually heard a different sociologist. I forget what his name was, but he said, actually, sometimes religion's the amphetamine of the masses. So what he pointed out was the African-Americans, quote-unquote African-Americans, the, the slaves in... Um, 
in America um, who they when when they some of them when they would try to break out of slavery they would point to passages in the, in the Bible where the Hebrews escaped slavery in Egypt and they would say yeah you see that it's it's okay to to break out of this bondage well the slave masters also looked at the Bible and they used it to say that slavery was okay what people do is they always pick out passages of the Bible that fit what they want um, the, the thing about the Bible is there's there's always there's, there's a lot of ways to interpret it, and it's purposely like that. It's intentionally like that. So someone looks at it and says, you know, he, he already has his idea of the way the world is, so he picks out things in the Bible that fit his um, prescriptions of how he thinks that the world should be and how it is. And then, you know, if someone else picks the opposite type of stuff. But there is one truth. Um, we'll get to that, hopefully. Um uh, So, yeah, so, but I think Marx is kind of correct in, in, in his ideas about religion. Remember, religion is a second quadrant um, field of inquiry. We had science as a first quadrant, religion is a second quadrant, art is a third quadrant, and <coughs> philosophy is a fourth quadrant. Um, usually the great philosophers in history, people, you know, tend to follow and they make dogmas out of their teachings and then they make them into religions. So the fourth quadrant and the second quadrant, there's always kind of a relationship. So we have religion. We're talking about religion and sociology. Religion is a very important part of sociology. Um, the way that I look at it is there's these main ethnicities. And ethnicity is a group that you associate yourself with. So you have sexuality, gender, sexuality is first quadrant, gender is second quadrant, race, class, and then the fifth one you have um, age. And this is this, these are the main ethnicities that I look that, that I that I see uh, the groups that you associate yourself with. So let's look at sexuality. Apparently, that uh, scientists say that there's four types of sexuality. Again, we have the quadrant. You have the homosexual, the heterosexual, the bisexual and the asexual. People wonder, is the asexual is really such a thing? Um, apparently there is, but I guess that's questionable. But yeah, apparently people say there is such a thing as asexual, someone who doesn't have any sexual attraction to anybody. Sometimes people say there's a possible fifth and it's kind of a spiritual type of sexuality. Remember the fifth is always kind of spiritual, godly. Um, but these are the main ones, the types of sexuality. Uh, <clears throat> then for gender, they also say that there's four types of gender. The first quadrant would be female. The second quadrant is male. The third quadrant is the mixture of male and female. And I forget the name of this. I have to look it up. But I think it's hermaphrodite type of thing. I think that's might be, that might be what it's called, hermaphrodite. And then there's a fourth type of gender, which is the absence of gender. And I forget the name of that, too. I'm going to be this. And people say that there's a fifth type of gender. So what gender is, is gender is your sex. It's not just your sex. So you have a sex, and that's determined by your chromosomes and your uh, sexual organs. So if you have a penis, you're a male. If you have a vagina, you're a female. Some people say that this is kind of continuous, but 
there obviously is, you know, males and females, and then there's hermaphrodites, and there's the one where there's people who don't have either, penis or vagina. Um, <clears throat> but also, sexuality, I mean, gender is not just this, but it's also the role that you play in society based on your sexual organs. So a male is supposed to have a certain role in society. Um... A female is supposed to have roles that, that go along with being female. So the stereotypical roles that people have associated with being a female is cleaning, first quadrant type of stuff. Cleaning, cooking, um, teaching, things like this. Uh, and I could get into this stuff more. I have more ideas with it, but it's unnecessary right now. We're just kind of trying to run through this a little bit. So then <clears throat> we have race. Um, there was a model that this woman made. <clears throat> I forget what her name was. But she said that there's, she talked about the triangulation of race. And she said that there is Asian, white, and black. And the way that she created these different types is, she had four dichotomies. The dichotomies were insider, outsider, and inferior, superior. I mean, well, two dichotomies. And from these two, dichot the two dichotomies, one was insider, outsider, that's one dichotomy, and inferior, superior is the other dichotomy. From these two dichotomies, you can get four types. So Asian, she said, was an insider, I mean, an outsider, and inferior. I messed that up completely. An outsider and superior. So the reason why an Asian person, she says, is an outsider and superior is outsider is associated with they're seen as weird. They're seen as different. If you look at the way the Asians are seen in America, um, they're seen as foreign. They have, they're seen as having strange customs. Uh, people say that they're kind of abstract thinkers, so think of them as like the NFs. They're kind of smart. They're too smart. This is what people say. It's not necessarily true, but they say that you know they're too smart. They're they're weird. They're strange. They're different. Um, so they're outsiders, but then they're superior. By superior, what she meant was that they worked hard. They work hard. They they don't they they try to fit into the environment. They you know they make money. They go to school. They they they're not. You know, so they're more conforming. So remember, the NFs are more conforming. The second quadrant is white. And white, she said, was insider and superior. So by insider, she means that, you know, they're, they're normal. They're not strange. They, they fit in. They're not too abstract thinkers. They're not... <clears throat> too much of abstract things. They're just not too smart. They're just, you know, they're, they're normal, you know, not sticking out in any way. They're insiders. And then you have <clears throat> that they're superior, that they're hardworking. They, um, they go to school. They vote. They do things that show that they are superior, quote unquote. They, they are, they're conforming. They conform to, to these high standards. Um, so this would be the stereotypical SJ. Then she said that the third one, black, is insiders and inferior. So she said, you know, the idea of about black people is that, you know, like white people, they're not necessarily seen as too weird. They're not too abstract. They're not doing too much abstract thinking. They're fitting in more. She's obviously these are stereotypes, and this is what she was pointing out. But she was saying that this is the way that black people are seen. Really, it all comes down to individuals. There's black people who are INTPs, there's black people who are INFJs, there's black people who are ISTJs. <clears throat> but she said the stereotype would be as is associated with them being SPs. <clears throat> the third quadrant, the doers. <clears throat> the doers, the thinkers and motors, doers and dreamers. <clears throat> so they're insiders, but they're inferior. So by being inferior, it means that they don't conform. They're not, they're, 
you know, breaking laws. They're seen as um, being dangerous. They are seen as being um, too wild, hypersexual, things like this that make them quote unquote inferior, you know, more spontaneous. So this is the stereotypical SP. She missed one category. The fourth is always left out. But if you have these two dichotomies, you're going to have four types. So the other dichotomy would be an outsider and inferior. So there must be a group that's an outsider and inferior. Well, that's the quote unquote brown people. So that in America would be Mexicans and other cultures. It's, you know, it's whatever the brown people are in that culture. In, in Florida, it might be Cubans. And this is how it works. So... Um, so the, but the interesting thing is brown people, remember the fourth quadrant is separate, but it encompasses the other ones. So, um, for instance, Indians, when I say Indians, I'm meaning people from India. Um, if, if you say native Americans, you're, you're referring to the people who are indigenous, although that's questionable because actually there's evidence that other people were there before. The Native Americans, but we can get to that later. But uh, but the indigenous people to America, um, or you can call them Amerindians. But so we have when I talk about Indians, I'm talking about the people in Asia, in India. So they consider themselves white, and they're considered white um, by you know, I guess biologists kind of see this. But this is this is so what racist is based on physical features. Remember, the third quadrant is always based on the physical. So we have sexuality, gender. This is based on your roles, what roles you play in society. Um, and then you have the, the race, which is based on physical features. <coughs> but they, they consider themselves white. But there, there were examples in history where an Indian person would go to the court and you would say, hey, I need equal rights to this white person because, you know, I'm technically white. And the... The judge or the jurors would rule that the person actually isn't white. He's brown. Um, and they would say, well, it, you, technically, okay, fine. Technically, these biologists or whoever are saying that you are white. But we know that you actually are really brown. Some, quote, unquote, brown people consider themselves more black. Some, quote, unquote, brown people consider themselves more Asian. So it's separate, but it encompasses the previous three. Um. <clears throat> so then once again is there a possible fifth um, I've heard you know back in the day Hitler said that the you know called the Jews a race well, let's look at this. Are the Jews a race? What a race is, what people say is it's defined by physical features. Do all Jews have the same physical features? We already talked about. There's Sephardic Jews. There's Ashkenazi Jews. Ashkenazi Jews can trace their lineage back to the Middle East and, and um, you know, like the Kohenim. They can trace their, their ancestors on their father's side back to the Middle East. And same thing with the Ashkenazi. They can trace on their father's side to the Middle East. Um, and... So, you know, so, yeah, so, but so the Sephardic people, they can trace their mother's and father's side to the Middle East. Um, like I said, my grandma is uh, Sephardic Jewish on her mom's side, and my, uh, and her dad is Ashkenazi Jew, or and my mom's dad is Ashkenazi Jew. Um, so... We have, so, okay, so we're talking about Jewish. So I've seen a lot of different, I've seen Sephardi Jews, Akhenazi Jews, different types of Jews. They look different in a lot of ways. Um, some people say that they, that Jews share similar features, but I've seen uh, Jews, people who call themselves Jews with blonde hair, straight blonde hair, blue eyes. I've seen, you know, ones that look more Middle Eastern, quote unquote. So you see a, a lot of variations. So can you say that Jewish is a race? I don't know. I don't think you can. Um, so, yeah, 
Although, like I said, genetic evidence proves that Jews throughout the world are related with each other. Um, which is pretty interesting. All right, so then you have race, then you have class. <coughs> class um, societies were always separated into um, pretty much four classes, but there's there's different types of ways that they've divided it. But let's look at the Hindu caste system. They had four classes: the Brahmins, which are the priests, the uh, they had a warrior class, a warrior ruler class, a farmer merchant artisan class, and a laborer class. So they have these four classes. It fits the quadrant model. The first quadrant, the priests, you know, the, the, the cerebral. The second quadrant, the rulers and warriors. They're telling people what to do. They're maintaining order, homeostasis. The second quadrant. Third quadrant, farmers, merchants, and artisans. They're doing things. And then the fourth quadrant, the laborers. They're, they're seen as really different. The laborers are seen as really different. Um, and then the, you, there's a, the outcasts, which are actually not even considered a caste. They're so different that they're not even a part of the caste system. They're outcasts. They're the untouchables. You can't even touch them. Gandhi said that they were God, something like God's children. Once again, the fifth is always related to God. You know, they don't have any belongings. And Gandhi said that this actually freed them. The fact that they were free of belongings, free, free of property, this brought them, brings them the closest to God. Um, <clears throat> so we have, we have the caste system and the Hindus, the... Um, the Chinese had the same exact caste system, uh, class system, except it was a little different in that their fourth class was the merchants. And they said that merchants were the bad fourth class. The fourth is always kind of seen as bad, right? They said that they were bad because they don't really do anything good for society. They just trade things. They don't, they don't ha do anything good. They they're not useful. The fourth quadrant is always seen as not useful. Um, one interesting thing I want to say is that in... In Europe, the Jewish people were forced to be merchants, and they were forced to. Um, hey, Grandma, yeah. what is it called? the 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 Jewish people in Europe they were forced to be merchants, and they were forced to be what is it? Goldsmiths. What's what's the word? Uh, jewelers. Jewelers. You know things like this because um, because um, in the Old Testament, there's a law against uh, having a taking interest from your brother, from a fe fellow Israelite. So the Christians adopted the Old Testament, and they, when they read this, they considered themselves the new Israelites. So they said, "Hmm, well, we can't take interest from each other, so we have to use the Jews to." to be our merchants, to be the traders and do all these things for us because, you know, we're, we're following their law, this, this law of theirs, even though they kind of, they, they follow certain laws. It seems like they pick and choose what they, they picked and choose what laws they wanted to follow, but they, they picked this law and they said, yeah, so we can't charge interest on each other. So we'll have the Jews do it for us. Then the interesting thing is later there was a lot of anti-Semitism against the Jews and they would say, yeah, you know, they're, they're money, they're, gr they're money hungry, greedy. Um, and the idea was, this is kind of ironic because they were the ones who originally forced them into these professions. And then later they start hating them and there's a lot of anti-Semitism against them because of this, but they were the ones who ended up, who originally created it. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So one thing I want to say, uh, just something that I was thinking about was thinking about the, I was thinking about the bloods and the crypts, but let's just talk about the bloods and, <coughs> and the religion of the Jews. So Marx didn't like Judaism. He thought it was too related to capitalism. He thought that all religion should be, you know, get, get gotten rid of. He didn't like religion, period. Um, so people claim that Marx was anti-Jewish. Um, I do want to point out something that, that I thought was interesting where I, I hear people say that the bloods, you know, they're, they're 
I was talking to my grandma about it and I was about the Bloods and she was saying that they were, you know, they're, they're not good people. They're kind of, they're gangsters or they're, they're hoodlums. They're not good people. But then I was saying, well, they're actually, let's look at some parallels between the Bloods and Jewish people. Okay, the Bloods, they have their, their dress code. They have to wear a red bandana and they have to wear their red stuff. Well, the Jews have to wear their kippah, their, the, not all, you know, not all, but the, the, conservative Jews, they, they wear their kippah, they wear their, their special outfits or, you know, whatever that pe Jewish people have to wear these certain outfits when they're doing Jewish stuff. Um, then you have, you know, the, the bloods, they say that they're a family, they trust each other, they're blood brothers. And, you know, you have to be either born into a blood or initiated. Same thing with the, with the Jewish people. You have to be born into being a Jewish person or you have to be initiated in that you can convert but it's difficult to convert in Judaism. I know uh, one of my one of the rabbis who I had, um, he was saying we were talking about Madonna, or some kids were talking about Madonna, and the rabbi said, Madonna's not really a Jew. And what he meant was she's a convert. So he he he's, so it's kind of he's looking at it as a racial thing or an or an ethnic thing. Um, so he said she's not really a Jew. It's because she's a convert. Um, so you see this kind of. Uh, I guess the word is eth ethnocentrism, um, kind of racism type of thing. Um, and so then, I, then you know, my grandma, my grandma was like, "Oh, these, these, they're completely different. There's, there's no similarities between the Bloods and the Jews." Well, then I say, "Okay, so there's the Blood Brothers. There's these types of things. Well, look at this too." So my, my, so my grandma's saying, well, you know, the, the bloods, they go around, they shoot, they shoot people and they, they kill people. Well, you know, this, this is, this isn't to be, you know, this, this, this isn't to be too controversial, but every group that's an insider group has to have outsiders and the outsiders solidify the inside group. So bloods have the crypts, they have these enemies, this solidifies their relationships with each other. Well, look at the Jews. They in, in Israel, they're fighting the Arabs right now, and there's there's wars with the Arabs, Arab countries, and this keeps the Jewish people solidified more by having an enemy. Always, when you have an outside group, you know you become more solidified. And there's killings or shootings and things going on with that. So I'm I'm telling my grandma this, and my grandma, she, my grandma's an SJ, and she's, you know. She's Jewish, so she's saying, no, there's no, there's no similarities. These things are completely different. But I'm pointing out all the similarities, and there's a lot of similarities. So then, then you look at the, there's rituals involved in Judaism. And there's also rituals involved in, with the blood. So the bloods, they have their, their um, special dances that they do, or the crypts, they have the crypt walk. Well, the Jews, when they're, when they're listening to their music, they're doing their, their dances. It's, you know, you, you, it's, it's the same type of, same type of stuff. And what I'm getting at is it's a sense of belonging. This desire to belong, a desire to have a group that you can trust, that looks out for you, that can help you out. And the Jews do this for each other. They help each other out. And the Bloods try to do this for each other too. And everybody wants to have a group like this. Everybody wants to have a social network, a safety net, uh, people who they can trust, people that can help them out. So, a lot of times you, you look at people like the Bloods and you dehumanize them. You say, oh, these people are horrible. But everybody is guilty of doing the same thing. And it's not necessarily guilty. This is just a fundamental human desire, motivation. It's a second quadrant motivation to belong. So we have belief, faith, behavior, belong. <laughs> So, <clears throat> what else did I want to talk about about sociology? Um, one thing I wanted to say, oh, so, but the reason why you see a lot of Jewish people with the names like gold, with gold in their name, or, you know, um, silver or stein means stone, it's because they were forced to be merchants. Um, and forced into 
these these trades involving uh, you know banking type of stuff. <clears throat> All right. So I've read Durkheim, I've read all these guys, and they all, everything they talk about is based on the form. You just have to read this stuff. Um, I don't want to get into all this stuff, but I just like to talk about things that, are, that I think are interesting. Um, so one thing I want to say, too, is... Um, People like Bill Maher, who are Jewish, um, are able to say things on their shows that I've noticed are kind of that that if, if a white person, a person who was just white and wasn't considered Jewish, if he said it, then he would be considered racist and it would be a bad thing. But Bill Maher can get away with it because he can say, you know, well, I'm Jewish and I also experienced this racism type of stuff. Um, <clears throat> I experienced this when I was in Israel talking to a, uh, this, this type of thing when I was talking to this lady and she was saying that, you know, uh, what, what happens in Israel is, okay, so, okay, this is another example. My grandma said, well, the bloods are, they're sexist against women. I'm not saying that the, that there's sexism necessarily, but in Israel, you know, the women have to wear, in, in the, in the Orthodox areas, the women have to wear wigs to cover their hair they're not allowed to be touched by by men until they're married and they're not allowed to be touched by men who are not married to them and things like this um so what i was getting at though is i was talking to this this woman who was saying that the orthodox religion is is the best way to go and actually i think that there's a lot of truth in what she was saying but she was saying that uh You know, she was saying that the, that the way that the Orthodox families work, it's, it's the best possible way. But then I asked her, well, you know, these Orthodox families, I noticed they have like seven, eight children. Uh, what do you think about the, you know, people might complain about overpopulation. Well, is it, is it, what do you think about all these, you know, families having all these children? And she says, you know, oh, you know, the first thing I respond in that is, is I say, well, look at the Holocaust. How can you tell me how many children I can have after, you know, I, we, we lost so many people in the Holocaust. So right when she brings up that, it ends a conversation because you can't go because because now you can't talk anymore because she's already brought this this thing up that's very emotionally charged and you can't go on to talk about it. So there's kind of an advantage sometimes in being a, a, a group, an ethnic group uh, that has had prejudice against it, things against it, because, you know, because now you're able to, to say, okay, I've had things bad, you know, that have happened to me. So, you know, I, I'm allowed to, to do these things and, and you have to go along with it. You know, you can't question it because, you know, and if you do anything, if you say anything against me, well, it's because you're, you're, you're prejudiced, you're racist, you're so on and so forth. So I think that this is an interesting aspect of sociology that I just want to say. Um, so let's talk about, in sociology, we have um, cults. I think cults are an interesting thing. So shot, there's this uh, Jewish guy named Shatai V. I think that's what his name was. I can't remember exactly. <clears throat> but he ended up getting this big following of people. So I was listening to a rabbi talk about this. <clears throat> and, he, and the rabbi was saying that um, this following thought that this guy was a messiah. He was going to bring about the messianic age. So the idea with the, with the Jews and the messiah is that the messiah is supposed to bring the 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 Jews to you know to glorify the Jews to bring them to you know the Israel everything's supposed to be good once the Messiah comes so they thought this guy Shatai Tzvi was going to be the Messiah then Shatai Tzvi got caught by some Muslims and they forced him to convert he converts then what do the people do they they look around at each other and they say hmm what do we do now our Messiah just converted to Islam so they said you know what this is this is it we all should convert to Islam. 
And this is the answer. This is what Shatai's view is trying to show us. That in order for the true perfect world to come, we should all convert to Islam. So they convert to Islam. So what the rabbi was saying was, he was saying that this is the same thing that happened with Christianity. <coughs> I'm not arguing either way. I actually have a different theory. <coughs> but he was saying that, um, you know, according to historians, historians believe that uh, Jesus was a messianic Palestinian Jew who wanted to bring about the the messianic age and they say that he did he failed to do it because he was crucified so then people what the this is what the rabbi was saying he says that then people say hmm what do we do now that he was crucified and this didn't happen well we have to say well this was what was supposed to happen and we should you know and, and now now we should we should we should uh continue to worship him and we should you know look at the passages from the old testament and shape them in a way that makes it seem like this is what was supposed to happen and that we should now um worship this guy and you know so he says that the that what this is what christians end up doing the first christians were jews um and then the jews thought you know should we even allow gentiles to become christian to become christians and then Paul came around and then Paul ended up converting um, the Gentiles, converting Gentiles to Christianity. <coughs> um, so this is one sociological experiment thing that, that, you know, this is what the rabbi was talking about. There's another example in sociology of a cult leader. <coughs> this guy, he was the cult leader for Heaven's Gate. He was named Marshall Applewhite and he described you know he thought that aliens were going to come and abduct people and that you know we were about the humanity was about to be freed so he, the thing is these cult leaders what i found is they actually say a lot of good stuff and this is why people follow them and they think that they're they're legit because they're saying things that are true so examples this heaven's gate guy was saying that you know we need to transcend our physical bodies and, you know, these aliens are going to help us do that. So there's this idea of transcending the physical. Remember, the fourth quadrant is about transcending. The, you, you transcend the physical when you're dreaming. And then contemplation, passion, flowing, knowing you're transcending the ego. Well, this is what this guy was talking about. He's saying that, you know, an important part of my cult is you, you must transcend your, your physical body. Um, the thing is also, a lot of these cult leaders, they have, it's it's almost like, I think that you know, they're, they're in touch with something, I don't know, but... They have these things where they say like, okay, we have four principles in our cult and they do everything based on fours. So this apple white guy, he even had four commands that he had the people do. I forget what they were exactly. I wrote them down on my phone. I lost a year's worth of notes on my phone. Um, but that's a long story. I'm not going to get into that, but I wrote it in my phone. I lost it. But the, I, all I remember was the second command he had was about Nike shoes. You have to wear black Nike shoes or something like that to be a part of this cult. The third one was you have to castrate yourself. And then the fourth one was they, I think that they took the potion uh, or whatever they took and they killed themselves. Um, remember, the fourth is always death. Castration fits the, you know, would be a third quadrant type of thing. And that was his third command. So even these types of things, they fit the model. So it's kind of strange. Um, I see these kind of cult leaders who say that they're being, have aliens talking to them. I often think that these guys are NFs who are doing this. Because I think that they're trying to fool people, and, and, and but what they're trying to do is they're trying. They think that they're helping people out by saying that there's you know life out there and there's hope, and that you know we may be saved by these aliens, and these aliens are trying to speak to me. So they have these aliens speak through them, and the, the aliens say things like you know you are all one, and everything is fine. You know things that I think that a idealist would stereotypically say to try to make people feel good. But then the weird thing is I look at some of these. What, what these uh, guys are talking about that, that say that they're being talked to through aliens or spirits and stuff like this new age type of stuff. A lot of times they'll say like the alien told me four principles and they were and it fits the quadrant model. Um, so there's strange stuff like that. You look at a lot of this new age stuff and you see the quadrant model and the new age stuff, too. Um, it's pretty interesting. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, okay. There was another example that the rabbi was talking about about a 
guy who uh, had a, got a cult together, and what he had the people do was, well, he, he ended up, he, 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 got, he had a cult, people thought that he was going to be the Messiah, um, he, I think he was a Jewish guy too, and then, uh, I don't know, maybe he wasn't, but anyways, this guy ended up having sex with the kids in the cult, and the interesting thing was that the people and the cult didn't say, oh, this is disgusting, we're going to leave now. They said, wait, because, you know, they, they're so invested in this. They have their beliefs set. They believe that this guy is, is definitely their leader. Once you have your beliefs and your faith set on something, then there's something called cognitive dissonance, and you start to think, okay, this guy did something bad, but my beliefs are so strong in this guy. So what they say is, hmm, well, we have to incorporate what this guy's actions into our belief system to make it so it's okay. So they said, you know what? This guy molesting our children, it's, it's an initiation act. And our children should be molested by this guy because it's an initiation act for this, for, they didn't say things was a cult, they said for our religion. And this is an important part of our religion. So what they end up doing is they say, okay, a lot of these, some people left, but most of them stayed and they say, okay, here guy, have our children and, and have sex with our children. This is a good thing. So sociology is very interesting how people seem are pretty irrational in a lot of ways. Um, so what the, the rabbi was saying was, this is again, an example of, he was saying that this is what the rabbi was saying. I'm not going saying either way, but the rabbi was saying that this is another example that the same thing happened with Jesus. Jesus didn't fulfill the requirements for the Messiah. So then the people didn't say, okay, we're going to not follow him now. Then they had to change their beliefs to say, okay, the Messiah has to suffer on the cross. And this is what the rabbi was claiming. <clears throat> but I think that we recognize that there is this important symbol of the cross in the cross. We have... This one guy, he wrote a book called this, I forget what the guy's name was, but it was called The 16 Crucified Saviors. So once again, we have the number 16, the 16 quadrants. And he pointed out that there are 16 saviors who are crucified throughout the world. Um, and people worship them. One was Quetzalcoatl. There's no coincidence that Quetzalcoatl's name was Q-U-E quadrant. And all these people have names that are similar, like Krishna, Jesus Christ, you know, similar types of names, similar types of stuff. Um, they die on the cross and, you know, it's the same type of thing. But we talked about the death, the death on the cross. The idea is that you die once you recognize that everything, that there's a pattern behind everything, that everything fits a certain pattern, a certain model. That everything is one. There's just this one being. All that exists is this quadrant. Just everything is a different manifestation of the quadrant, of this quadrant model. Um, physics, chemistry, biology, um, psychology. It's all just the, these man, this manifestation. <clears throat> then you die to yourself. Because you recognize everything is one. Everything is just this. Then what happens to you if everything is one? Everything is just you, you recognize that every part of your body is just a manifestation of, of the quadrant of this pattern. Well, then you die. But the thing is, you die to your old self. You die to your old beliefs that, you know, that you're a separate thing and that things are random. Things are um, you know, random, probabilistic, you know, and there, there is no structure in nature. There is no higher, higher reality, a higher source, higher power. And then you recognize, wait. There is a pattern behind everything. This isn't accidental. So now you rise to new life. You start to recognize, wait, there's something more going on here. Things aren't random. So you die to your old self, then you, you rise to, to this new, to, to a new way of seeing things. It's the death of the old, the birth of the new, the death and the resurrection. <clears throat> so there's 16 crucified saviors throughout the world. They died to their old you know, they, they, they died and they were res all resurrected. <clears throat> then there's other guys like Socrates. His, his thing followed the same narrative as um, these crucified saviors. So Socrates, 
he was seen, you know, he was trying to teach people the truth. And then people said, hey, this guy's a heretic. We hate him. And then they killed him. And it's interesting because he, he first had a cross-examination. I don't think it's a coincidence that he had a cross-examination before he was killed. And he had a choice to leave, you know, all these crucified saviors could have not been crucified if they didn't want to, but they all decided to do it. So Socrates could have left, but he said, you know what, I'm just going to take the hemlock, uh, the drink, that the poison drink that they give me. So he took it and then he died. Um, so it's the same type of story, same type of, uh, you have to really study this stuff, but it's, it's all the same type of pattern. Um, so I showed you guys that stuff. Now I think a lot of people are probably saying like, oh no, we believe in our religion and everything. But let me, let me tell you something. Okay. So now look at the world religions. You have four world religions. You have <clears throat> Buddhism. These are the four world religions. <coughs> Christianity. Islam, and you have Hinduism. <coughs> Buddhism is the first quadrant religion. Remember the first quadrant, the NFs? Buddhism is all about, you know, meditating, sensation, perception, you know, the idea that, you know, Buddhists say that, or Buddha said that there was no God, that, um, and that there is no soul, there is no afterlife, but you, you can never, when you look at a religion, do not look at the person who started the religion because the religion is going to be completely different. So what Buddhism actually is now is a bunch of people worship the Buddha. They give him gifts. They pray to the Buddha. Buddha didn't say to do this. They, they believe that their ancestors live on in spirits. So originally when Buddhism was first brought to China, the Buddhists, the Chinese people are saying, we don't, we don't want to have Buddhism. First off, the Buddha was an Indian guy and the Buddha and the Chinese were very against foreigners. Not all Chinese, remember there's individuals, but in general, they were against foreigners. So they said, you know, we don't want this Buddha guy, this, this Indian guy to be the head of our religion. But what historians say is that, you know, there's a lot of warring people in China. There's a lot of wars going on and stuff in probably they thought that a good idea would be to, to bring people together is to bring them under this one religion, Buddhism. Um, so that that's one theory of why Buddhism became big. But people thought, yeah, you know, may, maybe we can adopt this. Maybe it's going to be a good thing. And they, 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 they thought they saw truth in it. So they adopted Buddhism. Um, and, but so, like I said, they, they believe that. It, so, so they, they heard, okay, the Buddha said that there is no soul. But the, but the Chinese people said, well, we know there's a soul. Of course there's a soul. Our old, you know, we have, we used to have these, they, they used to have, you know, pagan ideas or different types of ideas. They believe there were, that there were a lot of gods and stuff like this. And they believe that there were a lot of souls. And they said, of course there's a soul. So, and of course our ancestors live on. And of course we have to uh, continue to give food to our ancestors. And of course we have to pray for our child's success in school and so my friend from Taiwan was saying that he his, his family is Buddhist and he says that they pray for him um, to do well in school and do all these things. And it's the exact opposite of what the Buddha talked about. Um, but so, okay, so we have Buddhism, but the idea about Buddhism is it's supposed to be based on meditation. They're supposed to be vegetarians. Remember the NS tend to be vegetarians, you know, nonviolence, they're supposed to be nonviolence. Not trying to do do uh, too many, you know, egocentric things. So this is a first quadrant type of religion. Um, sensation, perception, response, and awareness. Then we have the second quadrant, um, Christianity. Christianity is all, you know, like I said, it started off. Um, Jesus was a was a Jew was a Jewish uh, guy who. Um, you know, he, he was a carpenter. a carpenter and what ended up happening was Paul start, he, he converted, um, after Judaism 
or you know after Jesus died um, he uh, he started to convert or this 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 is what people say this is what historians believe he started to convert um, the Gentiles and so what I mean by Gentiles and non-Jew it's not a, a derogatory term it just means someone who's not Jewish um, and they adopted Christianity and what Christianity is about if you read if you listen listen to Christians they're always talking about like obedience we got to be obedient to God and follow you know follow Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus and it's always about this relationship a personal relationship second quadrant right second quadrant is always about having personal relationships with Jesus and they say you know it's all about belief and faith and you know you have to be a good person you have to behave and it's about belonging, you know, we, it's about family. Ironically, we're, we can get to this, but Jesus, what he actually taught is way different. But this is what it, what it's about. So it's about family. And if you, if you go to a stereo, if you go to a Christian place, you know, and, and you have to have the, the, these beliefs and you have to have a good faith and it's all about, it's very faith based. And this is what Paul was all about. So Paul was all about belief and faith. So this is what Christianity is. This, the second quadrant, belief, faith, behavior, belonging. <clears throat> the third quadrant, we have Islam. Islam, so the interesting thing about Islam is it, it says that there is one God and that God is Allah. And that's the same God of the Jews and the Christians. They said that the Christians got it wrong when they said that Jesus was, was God and and they said that the Trinity is, is a false notion and that there is, you know, there, there should only be one God. This God is Allah. Um, you know, the Christians say, well, Jesus was God. And, and, and then the, 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 Islam, the Muslims say, no, he wasn't God. He, 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 it's very, they say it's very clear that Jesus did never really said that he was God. But then the Christians say things like, well, you know, the, the prophets in the, in the Old Testament, they would say things like, God told me to say this. But instead, Jesus said, I tell you this. So they're saying that Jesus didn't need to go through God because, you know, he was, he was God. This is what the Christian, this is what a lot of Christians say. Um, they say things like when Jesus, when uh, the Pharisees asked Jesus, you know, are you, are you God or are you the son of God? And Jesus says, I am. They said that this was an illusion. It was alluding to when the burning bush that Moses saw said, you know, I am. And they were saying that this was Jesus subtly saying that he was God. So they, they point to things like this. Um, <clears throat> to say that Jesus was God. Um, the, Islam, the Muslims say, no, this is completely wrong. So what they, Muslims do is, is they start to think about it. They think, emote, do, dream, remember, but thinking is ego-based. Um, so this is, what the, this is what Muslims do. They, they use what is called textual, I forget what it's called exactly, but something like textual analysis, where they look at the Christian Bible and they say, hmm, according to this guy, Bert Ehrman, and other, and other people like this, um, it's clear that this they think that this text has been uh, adulterated things have been changed and in fact the original text you know uh, demonstrated that Jesus didn't think that he was the messiah that Jesus didn't think that he was the son of god that these were added later so they point out things like you know, Jesus sometimes seems to be saying that the son of man who is supposed to be the Messiah figure that was talked about in Daniel is a different person. But then sometimes it seems like he's referring to himself. So what the historic historians say is, well, if they were, if the people who are writing this book, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't take out, you know, you, you, you would think that they would, that they would take out the parts where, you know, Jesus made it seem like the son of man was a different person. But they said the fact that they didn't take it out shows that these parts were central to the original teachings and that they couldn't take it out. So they didn't take it out, but they added on parts where it seemed like Jesus was what, what, what was being referred to as the son of man. So they, this is what the Islam, Muslims say. So they say, yeah, I see Jesus, you know, the, 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 the texts were, were changed. Um, they say that, um, 
any part that might indicate that Jesus was God was was added on by later people <coughs> who uh, changed the Bible. The, the fascinating thing is that, remember, the thinking, emotion, doing, and dreaming, it's ego-based, egocentric. So while they question, they think about Christianity. So another thing that they think about is they say, okay, Jesus actually didn't really die on the cross. He faked it. This is what some people say. Or they, some people say that um, Judah or Judas was put on the cross instead. But some people say that Jesus actually didn't die on the cross, that he, that he, he faked it. So the evidence is Jesus is only on the cross for a few hours. It usually takes days for someone to die on the cross. He wasn't on the cross for very long, so they said that, you know, this is, this is evidence that, you know, why, why would they say, why would the person who wrote the gospel account, um, so they're looking at this as historical, they're not looking at it as literary. I just want to mention that. But they say, why would the person who's, uh, who's writing this gospel account, why would he uh, say that it only was, you know, the few hours, this, this would give it away that it could have been fake. You know, he would... So it's, it's showing that, you know, he couldn't change it because perhaps there were a lot of people who saw that it was only a few hours and he couldn't say that it was a few days. So he had to keep it a few hours. And, you know, this is, this, so they're saying what this is demonstrating is perhaps, you know, perhaps there was some sort of funny business going on and Jesus actually was taken off the cross before he died. And, and one thing that they say is, for instance, there was a, uh, a sponge that was given up to Jesus and he drinks out of it and then he immediately dies. So they say that perhaps this was some sort of poison thing that knocked him unconscious um, to make it seem like he was dead. So this is, so, so, not all Muslim people say this. I've heard some Muslim people say this and most of them don't go, don't go that extreme. Most of them say that, you know, Jesus was actually just switched, you know, Judas was switched with Jesus. The reason why they say this is because it says in the Quran, that Jesus actually did not die on the cross. So what they have to do is they have to fit their ideas of the Christian Bible into their into their Quran. So like I said, it's egocentric. Um, they're questioning the Jewish Bible, but they don't question the Quran. So they say the Quran is the perfect word of God and it's unchanged. It's never been changed. They say that the Christian Bible and the Jewish Bible has been changed a lot. But they say the Quran is perfect. So while they are thinking, while they're questioning the old stuff, they are also being egocentric and saying they're not applying the same analysis to their own text. So we have the third quadrant. Then you have Hinduism, the fourth quadrant, about contemplation, passion, flowing, and knowing. <clears throat> Hinduism is like that. Hindu, the thing about, the, remember the fourth quadrant, it's separate from the other ones, but it also encompasses the other ones. So Hindus say, some Hindus say that, you know, there's a ton of gods. There's there's multitudes of gods. But um, but so they accept the Buddha. They say that Buddha was just another avatar of you know Krishna, perhaps. And they say they accept Jesus. They say you know, Jesus was also an avatar of Krishna. And they accept Muhammad. They say Muhammad was you know a great man. Or you know they say things like this. So they accept <coughs> all these religions. So while it's separate from them, it accepts all of them and encompasses all of them. <clears throat> also, so I was talking about Krishna. Remember, Krishna was put on the cross too. Krishna had four heads. Um, so a, a lot of Hindus say that Krishna, who's, who's an avatar of actually Vishnu, they say that Krishna is the, the god of all the gods. He's the, the main god. And, and, I've, and some Hindus say that everything is just a manifestation of Krishna. So remember I said that everything is a manifestation. Everything comes out of the cross. So this is what the Hindus say. Everything is just a manifestation of Krishna. You can see Krishna in all things. Um, interestingly, some Hindus even go so far as to say that, so what they say is, look at all the gods. There's thousands, or there's these hundreds of gods. So it's impossible to worship all these gods. So there's been some philosophical Hindu people who say, well, the reason for this is because it's trying to make it so we don't worship these gods. What this it's trying to lead us to the realization, and this is what I'm not saying this is true, but this is what some Hindus say that we that the that the human is actually God, that the man himself is one with the Atman or the universal soul, and that there is no God except man himself. Interestingly, even Jesus said among when he was talking to his people that you know 
the, he said something about being the son of God. And then he said, you know, aren't, doesn't it say in the Old Testament that we are gods or sons of God? And then the people were like, oh, no, no, no. And they got mad. But this is what the Hindus were saying. They were saying that, or some Hindus, not all of them, but some say that there is no God. That man actually um, is God. So this can be a tendency seen in, con in, in the fourth quadrant. Remember I said a lot of, a lot of people who are NTs tend to be atheists or um, not like religion. <coughs> I'm an INTP. This one. Um, so we have the Buddhism, uh, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and then the people say there's a possible fifth world religion, Judaism. But they say it's actually not a world religion because it doesn't actively convert people. So it's once again the fifth is always questionable. So um, just to go over really quickly. I just want to talk like Buddhism. It starts off with Buddha. He sees four people suffering or four different sufferings, and the last one that he saw was death. The fourth is always death, and it all fits the quadrant model. So he sees these four sufferings, and then he decides, you know what? I'm going to live this um, ascetic life where I'm going to be a wanderer. You know, wandering is kind of synonymous with the flow, actually, because when you wander, you don't know where you're going to go next. Remember I said when you're flowing, your next move is always spontaneous. You don't know what you're going to do next. So, you know, Buddha ended up being a wanderer and he, you know, gave up all his possessions. He originally was actually a prince. Um, and is, it's, this is always the, ir the irony. This is always what ends up happening. It's, par it's called paradoxical intention. That fought, that his dad tried to make it so... Because he, the dad received an oracle that, um, he, or maybe it was his mom. Well, also, Buddha had a a, a virgin birth, kind of like you know, in the story of Jesus. So, in the story of Buddha, there's a virgin birth, and then Buddha, um, you know, his he's he's told that either he's going to be a great prince, something like this, or that he's going to be a, a religious leader. And the dad was like, "Shoot, I want him to be a prince." So what he ended up doing was he tried to hide his son from all suffering to make it so that, you know, he would stay in the palace and he would become a prince. But in his attempt to try to hide the Buddha, and actually the Buddha's name was a different, he had a different name, but we'll just call him the Buddha. The Buddha means the awakened one. Um, in order to hide the Buddha, he, <coughs> um, in order to keep him as a prince, he tried to hide him. But actually... In his attempt to in an attempt to hide him, he actually made it so the Buddha became discontent being a prince. And then he, like I said, he walked out. He saw the four suffering things, and then he said, "You know what? Life is suffering." And then he came up with the four noble truths. Um, once again, we have the quadrant. Um, The first one is that uh, it says this is noble truth of dukkha. Birth is dukkha. Aging is dukkha. Illness is dukkha. Death is dukkha. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, despair. Uh, you know, <coughs> union with what is displeasing is dukkha. Separation from what is pleasing is dukkha. Not to get what one wants to is dukkha. In brief, the five aggregates sub subject to cleaning cleaning are dukkha. So this is the first noble truth. So what it's saying is don't attach yourself to anything. The second one is, or, or, or you know, don't, don't cling, you know, all these. Well, basically, the first one actually is just life is suffering. The second one is this is the noble truth of origin of dukkha. It is a craving which leads to renewed existence accompanied by delight and lust, seeking the light here and there. That is craving, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. So this is the second one. Remember, the second one's always about relationships, craving, Wanting things, you know, trying to be happy. This is the second noble truth. Then the third one is, this is a noble truth of cessation of dukkha. It is the remainderless fading away and cessation of that same craving. The giving up and relinquishing of it. Freedom from it, non-reliance on it. So what he's saying here is that there's a way that you can cease this suffering. So once again, the third quadrant is always action. So there's something you can do to alleviate your suffering. The fourth one, this is a noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of dukkha. It is the noble eightfold path. That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So this is the fourth one. It's saying that this is the way that you, you seize 
the suffering. Um, so we have the Four Noble Truths. And then you go throughout all Buddhism and you see the quadrant everywhere. You even see the, the, the you, I was reading some Buddhist stuff and you see the 16, you know, they talk about 16 things and 16 things and Buddha, I can get into, I can get into the teachings a lot, but it's interesting stuff. But, and then we have Christianity. Um, we can talk about this stuff more later. Um, but all, all these religions, it's all stuff is based on the quadrant. I read the Bhagavad Gita. I read the Quran. Um, the quadrant is central to everything. You can't understand anything without the quadrant. So um, hopefully continue more in a little bit.